Respect is a major part of our school, and it seems that respect is a major part of what you do. To be respectful when you are taking a picture of a human, we ask the permission. How do you ask an animal permission to take their picture? Well, obviously we can't, but I think we can still be very respectful. And what that means to me is certainly not harassing an animal. You know, I've often said that underwater photographers don't have the luxury that our terrestrial counterparts do. You know, I have colleagues that can sit in a blind with a very long telephoto lens in Africa trying to take pictures of of lions or great apes or something and and you know I don't have that luxury I can only go underwater for a certain amount of time and I have to get very close so it really means that the animal has to allow me into its world it has to allow me close and I think it's a testament to the animals that they do most times and when they don't you know there's no advantage in chasing them all that's going to do is harass them and it's 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 not respectful so I think you know, in, in a way, asking permission means being patient, being quiet, just kind of waiting until the animal is comfortable with you and comes close enough, and then you're going to be able to make those pictures, and they will be far better than a stressed animal that you're, you know, harassing somehow. You've gone from film still photography to digital still photography. Lots of other famous photographers have done the same thing and then moved on to moving pictures. How do you think still pictures tell a story differently than a moving picture? Hmm, well, that's a great question. I think they do two very different things. Um, I've always been intrigued by both, and I love both, and both mediums have a place. I tend to probably appreciate still photographs a little bit more just because they're they're a little more quiet to me you know I can take my time with a still photograph and <clears throat> let my eye sort of wander around you know a really great still photograph often has some complexity to it it might have layers of of things happening in the picture and really interesting composition and a, a good still photograph often has what I call gesture or grace. You know, you can shoot a hundred pictures and the one that ends up getting published in National Geographic is sometimes one where something is just a little bit special, you know, the way a person's hand is moving or the expression on their face or the light comes in a different way. All the other photographs might be very technically good, but that one that has something special really is unique. And I love that. It's like looking at a, at a painting, you know, it's like going to an art gallery and seeing great great paintings um, where you could just sit there for hours and, and not get tired of it. So I like the medium of still photographs. That being said, I love movies too. You know, I love going to the movies and seeing a great film. And, um, you know, in nature, there are certainly some behaviors that are best captured by video, you know, um, a spawning behavior of, of, of fish or some feeding behavior, you know, a marlin cutting through a school of fish and using its its bill to, to you know catch fish and things. Something like that would be very dramatic um, on film. So I appreciate both and I think both have a, a real obviously a, a great place in moving people but I tend to gravitate towards stills and I also read a long time ago that the human brain actually stores memories particularly even like film as still frames. So even when you think about a movie that you love you're thinking about it as a single frame, you know, in individual single frames. That's just the way the, the human brain works, according to what I read. So I think we're, we're naturally inclined to see things as a, as a still frame. Anyway. Okay. So Mike Degree is a famous underwater photographer and was a parent at our school. Yep. He took us to the Channel Islands and was always like a little child. In what ways are you still like a little boy? Well, I'd like to first say that Mike was also a great friend of mine, and I have nothing but the greatest respect for Mike DeGree. Um, we were friends, we were colleagues, but he was also a great inspiration to me. I remember 
looking at some of the footage that he did of animal behavior in the ocean. You know, we both shared a love of cephalopods, of octopus and squid and cuttlefish, and he was a master at capturing that kind of video footage. He also did some, you know, pioneering work. I was just in Argentina last week in a place where years ago Mike photographed orcas coming up on the beach and, and predating, you know, feeding on these seal pups, and he did great shark behavior. You know, he wasn't satisfied just making a beautiful series of images with his video or stills, mostly video. He was interested in making beautiful video of great behavior that nobody else had seen. So, you know, we, we, we've lost so much with Mike. And as you said, he was so exuberant, had such a great lo zest for life, and was passionate about the things that he did. So it's a great loss. As to how I am still like a little boy, I think that's a very important quality for a good photographer or a scientist. You know, I think you always have to remain curious about the world. You're always intrigued about the mysteries, what we don't understand. We're always trying to peel that onion. You know, there's this another layer and another layer and another layer, and eventually we're going to get to the middle and figure it all out. And that's what it's about. You know, when I'm in the field, I think I have that naturalist curiosity. I'm looking at things, I'm trying to figure it out, and I may not understand it all, but if I can even put together a few pieces, I, I feel pretty happy. So um, I think it's incumbent upon any photographer to have that sort of boy-like or child-like um, curiosity, and that's what keeps us going. Yeah. In many of our interviews, we ask people what they hope their legacy will be. If it's okay, we would like to ask you that question just a little differently. What would you hope your legacy, L-E-G-A-S-E-A, -E -E would be? I like that, that's very nice. Well, you know, I guess time and, and history will, will tell, but I would like it to be that I inspired other people. Um, you know, it's all about passion in this world, and I think if we're passionate and excited about the things that we do, it's infectious, and it, in, it, it helps other people to want to follow their dreams. And from the time I was a, a little boy, young boy, I was dreaming about all kinds of great adventures and things that I wanted to do. And I've been very blessed to be able to realize that dream, you know, to be a National Geographic photographer, to go out and experience animals and make pictures and tell stories has been a dream come true. And the thing that I've always hoped for is that I didn't care so much about winning a lot of awards, I didn't care about making a lot of money, but what I always wanted was to inspire other people, that, you know, that that would live on and that others would go out and do their own thing and that, you know, collectively we can make a difference. No one person, no one man, no one woman is going to change the world probably by themselves. Maybe, but collectively we can be much more powerful. So I think it's about inspiring each other and building on the work of others. And I guess if I could have one legacy uh, dream, it would be to say that I, um, I inspired others. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for your Thank time. You. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Good. All right. That was great. good. Really great questions, guys. I mean, I've been interviewed by a lot of people, and those were some of the best questions I've ever had. I'm not Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much.